in the church we have <coughs> feast days that are movable and feast days that are set. Today, February the 2nd, is the feast of the presentation of our Lord in the temple. It is one of those fixed feast days. Every February the 2nd is the commemoration of the presentation of our Lord in the temple. And because it is a fixed feast day, it does not always fall on a Sunday. But this year, February 2nd, is a Sunday, so we have an opportunity to celebrate the presentation of our Lord in the temple. So let me do a quick refresher of the church calendar, if you will. We begin with the Advent season, and then we have Christmas. Christmas is a fixed feast day. December 25th is always going to be Christmas, at least for us in the West. In the East, Christmas is January the 6th. For us in the West, Christmas is always December 25th. Seven days after Christmas is the Feast of the Holy Name. Now, we're so caught up with Christmas and New Year and all of that, we don't spend much time with these fixed feast days. The Feast of the Holy Name is January 1. Guess what we're doing on January 1 for most of the world? <laughs> Recovering from hangover. <laughs> You know, we've just been watching the ball drop or whatever else people do for December 31st to January 1. They're not talking about being in church. Some of us still try to celebrate the Feast of the Holy Name, but that's the celebration for us in the church from December 25th to January 1, the Feast of the Holy Name, that's what the church sets apart for us to commemorate <coughs> The name given to Jesus. Now, what are these things about? They are all part of the Jewish culture. Seven days after the birth of the child, is named. And he is circumcised. So, we remember that for Jesus. Seven days after being a typical Jewish boy, this is what is happening. 33 days after the Feast of the Holy Name is the Feast of the Presentation, which is today. But between the Feast of the Presentation is another feast called Epiphany. <coughs> January the 6th. For us in the West, when we are celebrating <coughs> Epiphany, the church in the East is celebrating Christmas. The Sunday after Epiphany, again, let me quickly point out, the Feast of the Epiphany is a fixed feast day. And what we mean by that again? It's a date on the calendar. January the 6th is always the Feast of the Epiphany. If it falls on the Sunday, then we have an opportunity to celebrate the, the Feast of the Epiphany. This is when many places they have the wise men coming to be present to, to show to be shown Jesus, if you will. The Feast of the Epiphany being January the 6th, if it falls on the Sunday, it takes over. But if it not, the Sunday following January the 6th. We commemorate the baptism of our Lord, the first Sunday after Epiphany. By this time, I'm sure you're trying to get all these dates together. <laughs> Stay with me. I told you I'm going to give you a quick history of the church. <laughs> so we have the Feast of the Epiphany, and the Sunday after the Epiphany is the baptism of our Lord. So the first Sunday after the Epiphany, we have the commemoration of the baptism of our Lord. In the Episcopal Church, it's one of the days set apart for baptism. If we have candidates for baptism, we do it on that day. And then we come to February the 2nd, which happens to fall on a Sunday this year. The Feast of the Presentation of our Lord. Forty days after the birth of Christ, Mary, Joseph come to the temple, bring Jesus to present him because it is part of the Jewish custom. Back in Exodus chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, God says, the firstborn is mine, of human and animal. And so, Jesus, the firstborn, is brought to the temple to be presented to God and for the sacrifices that are required by the law of Moses to be made. That's what we are commemorating today, the Feast of the Presentation. 
when Jesus is presented in the temple. The important thing I, I believe we should uh, reflect on is the fact that Mary and Joseph, being religious folks, are making sure that Jesus is raised in the custom and practices of the Jewish culture. At this point, he has no choice. He's an infant. He's a young boy. So his parents are raising him to be a religious person. Mary and Joseph have brought Jesus to the temple for the presentation. They meet someone who has been waiting for all his life because he's been promised by God that you will not see death until you see the Messiah of God. And when Mary and Joseph come into the temple, Simeon comes. Some of you for, in the Episcopal Church way back when we used to do morning prayer, evening prayer, you remember the nukes the methods? Yes, this is the, this is the one who said that. Lord, now let it assemble depart in peace. For these eyes of mine have seen the Savior whom you have been. That's the Savior. This is the one who says that when Jesus is brought into the temple. Finally, I cannot depart this life because I have seen the Savior. Now imagine yourself being Mary and Joseph and somebody received your infant child and they say this. You're like, what is he talking about? Man. That would be my reaction. Mary and Joseph are trying to raise their infant son and people are saying all kinds of strange things about him. You can rest assured that they are going to be looking at this young man wondering what is he going to be when he grows up. I suspect Joseph is just focused on trying to help him become a good carpenter like himself. But things are going to be different. Many things are said about the one who is presented in the temple today. The one who is God with us. The one that Mary and Joseph have the responsibility of caring for and protecting <laughs> until he can take off by himself. It is Luke who tells us about them going to the temple regularly, annually for, for the feast until he is 12. When they make that trip and return home, and then he disappears. And we don't hear from him again until he shows up by the river Jordan to be baptized by John. What has been happening, we do not know. But if anything we can surmise from all that I've just shared with you, Mary and Joseph are looking at this young boy and wondering, what is he going to do when he grows up? We've heard people say a lot of things about him. And probably looking to see. As I pointed out to you in the past, after the trip to Jerusalem uh, and re the return when Jesus is 12, Joseph disappears off the scene. We have no mention of Joseph again in, in, in the gospel. <laughs> At least Mary is still around. She's going to be there when he turns water into wine. She's going to be there when he is crucified. Joseph is nowhere to be found. Could it have been that from 12 to 30, Joseph had busied himself training Jesus to be a carpenter, and after that, Jesus is done with being a carpenter, he's now going to be a rabbi? I do not know, but it's one of those things. For us as parents, you're watching him in the kindergarten, and then he's in first grade, and you're already figuring out what he's going to be when he grows up, and he becomes the opposite of what you've been praying for. Joseph had been training Jesus to be a carpenter. He grows up to be a rabbi. Joseph, welcome to the world. <laughs> we haven't given up yet, have we? We keep trying to get them to be what we want them to be, and then they grow up to be something else. Joseph and Mary have been told, he is going to be something else. And Joseph said to himself, I suspect that like Wilma will, yeah, I'm going to make sure he's a carpenter. He's going to be like me. We're going to spend every waking hour in the carpenter shop and doing what we need to do so he has a way to pay his bills. When he turns 40, I don't want him to come back home. I want him to be gone. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And I'm saying my prayers now. They haven't turned 30 yet, but I'm hoping that at our time they'll be gone. Yeah, you know, Joseph is busy himself helping Jesus to become a carpenter, not knowing that he is not going to be a carpenter. He's going to take off, and he's going to gather people around him, and he's going to be preaching. Because he has a mission. He has a calling. 
to live a life to help you and me see what it's like to live a life dedicated and committed to God. My bread and my meat, he will say to his disciples, is doing the will of the one who sent me. As sons and daughters of God, you and I, like Jesus, you say, my bread and my meat is doing the will of the one who sent me. The one who was presented in the temple as God's revelation to the world, as God with us. That one was focused on doing that which God has sent him to do. What is it that God has sent you to do? What is it that God has sent me to do? It is my hope and prayer that my life is being lived in, in a way that someone will have a reason to give glory and honor to God when I depart this life. No, I did not say I'm being perfect. I would like to think that I am, but never mind that. I'm simply saying to you that I pray that each day as I go about living my life, with all my limitation and imperfection, that I am living in a way that someone will have the reason to say, thank you God that I met Wilbur in this life. Is that your prayer as well? That when your days on earth are ended as they are, and life is changed and not ended, Someone will have a reason to give glory and honor to God because they met you in this life. Jesus reminds you and me that his life mission was to do the will of the one who sent him. Mary and Joseph may not have been able to understand what was being said about him, whether it was the visitors from the east, who came when he was still in the manger, or it is Simeon and Anna in the temple when he is presented, <laughs> or it is John the Baptist who said, Behold, the Lamb of God, whatever the case may be, everyone who saw him and saw something else, even if they didn't fully comprehend what it was, it was something about his life that he knew for himself. I am called to do the will of the one who sent me. And so, he lived his life in order to help you and me see what it's like to live life committed to God. And in the process, living that life will cause him the cross. He will give his life so that you and I may have life and have it in his fullness. On this day, on this fixed feast day, of the presentation of our Lord in the temple. May we too be presented to God with all our imperfections and limitations. May we be presented to God by our Lord and Savior Jesus and may we be sanctified to be the witnesses of the one who knows us better than we know ourselves. And finally, I've talked a lot about fixed feast days and movable feast days. Now let me conclude by telling you about the movable fixed days, like Easter. You know as well as I do, Easter is almost like someone keeps playing with the calendar. One point Easter is early and then one point Easter is later. This year, trust me, Easter is going to be April 20th. I mean, you want to talk about Easter being late, it's almost in May. Easter is a movable feast day, and what that is is that it's not fixed. It's not a particular date. It is moving unlike Christmas. So depending on when uh, we begin the Advent season and move forward, how many Sundays we have in Epiphany, Easter can be early or late. And I'm not going to get into all of the history of that again, but I just want to conclude that because I spoke much about fixed, fixed feast days. I wanted to conclude by telling you about movable feast days like Easter. That is not on a particular day. It, it's going to be on a Sunday, never on a Monday, but it's going to depend on when we begin the, the, uh, the Lenten season that we're going to be. So, as you know, um, when we have um, Ash Wednesday in March, 
then Easter is in April. But my brothers and sisters, as I now conclude, our Lord was presented in the temple. He, his life was not meant to be one that was so removed from us. His life followed the typical pattern of a Jewish boy growing up in the gospel. But in the end, that life was lived in a way to show you and me one that is committed to the ministry of the call of God. May we seek each day in our lives to live in a way that will help others to see the Christ in us. For we have been crucified with Christ. Yet we are not the ones who live. It is Christ who lives in us. When we go forth from here, may the world see the Christ <coughs> in us this day and always. Amen. Amen.